Would you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Uh, the Lord reminded me two things this morning. Uh, whenever I preach a message like that in a church like this, I always have, on Sunday morning, I have folks that look at me like, so why are you preaching that to me? We're all saved here, preacher. But I think the Lord ever once in a while wants us to go back and just remember where we were when God found us. Amen. And uh, I don't know about you, but I can just rejoice when I start thinking about what God did and how he did it to get me saved. Amen. Amen. So that's one thing. The second thing is the Lord had to remind me I don't know about you, but every time I come to church, I expect somebody to get saved. You say, well, you're strange. Well, I don't. That's not bad. My wife's been saying that for 49 years. I mean, why shouldn't we expect somebody to get saved? Amen. Amen. And uh, I was praying. I said, Lord, you know, I know there's lost folks there because nothing else. You haven't preached that message. And, and, and the Lord said, uh, you had to soak for a while, don't you remember? Y'all remember soaking for a while? <laughs> oh, I do. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and thinking, Lord, if you come again, you just got to take me and knowing I was going to go to hell. Amen. And uh, so I've been praying this afternoon. Those lost folks were here this morning. God just soak them good. Amen. Amen. Bring them to him in his time. Now, I'm not a patient fellow. Hello. You know, my mama used to say, whatever you do, don't pray for patience because tribulation works with patience. And one day I said, Mama, you do understand what you're saying is not Bible. Hello. He said, tribulation works patience. Patience experience. You're never going to get experience until you learn patience. Goes on down and says, hope and hope makes not ashamed. You see, there's a lot of folks and they're out saying they're Christians. And, and you, you go to them, you sit down with them. They got a good salvation experience, but they're not serving God. They're not a witness for the Lord. They have no boldness. You know Why? Because they don't want to suffer. <laughs> Hello. Well, that's another message. Amen. <laughs> Maybe we do that another time. Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, let me just uh, read it, if you will. If, if you can and you will, would you stand and uh, honor the Word of God and follow along in your copy of His Word as I read from mine? <laughs> Excuse me. Romans chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated of the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What did he promise? He promised the gospel. Folks, the gospel wasn't new to the New Testament. It's all through the Old Testament. started out, if you remember, in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 3, concerning... What's the gospel about? Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord which was made of the seed of David according Amen. to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, got any folk, Cajun folks in here? No, I didn't figure so. Let me give you a Cajun word. It's the word lanyap. Lanyap means just a little bit more. Put just a little more cream in your coffee, a little more uh, whipped cream on top of your pie, a little bit more. Let me give you a little bit more. Look at verse 4. He said, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. See that word dead? It's a plural. How do I know he is the very son of God? He got up. Yeah. Buddha's never got up. Confucius never got up. They're not going to for a long time. Amen. Right. 
Get this. The proof that he's the son of God with powers. The fact he got up, but it's a plural. Remember back in Matthew 27? It says that after Jesus' resurrection, there's a whole bunch of Old Testament saints got up out of the cemetery and walked through the city of Jerusalem. That's another time I'd love to been a bug on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Sadducees standing there, you know, on the street corner, and, and Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, didn't believe in miracles. That's the reason they were sad, you see. <laughs> Man. And uh, Father Abraham comes walking up. And the Sadducee says, who, who, who are you? And he said, I'm Father Abraham. Oh, can't be. Yeah, it is. And it proves that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with power. Hello? But it's a plural. There's coming a day when Jesus will return. And if it's after we go to the grave, amen, I'm going to tell you something. We're coming out. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. And I'm going to tell you, that resurrection is proof that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with power. Glory. Wait a minute. Go to Revelation chapter 20. The Bible says that those lost folks are going to be called up out of the grave, called up out of hell, called up out of the fire. The idea that's used there is a resurrection, and they'll stand before Jesus Christ. He's the just judge. Amen. And it proves that he's the Son of God with power. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. A little bit of line you up tonight. I want to draw your attention to verse 1. We'll not complete the verse, but we'll do our best. Amen. Romans chapter 1, <coughs> excuse me, and verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for grace and mercy, the kindness you've given us. Thank you for life. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Lord, thank you for our wives, our husbands, our children, our parents. God, thank you for everything that you do. Lord, I pray you direct our attention to your word. Lord, would you direct our attention to Jesus Christ. Make us a reflection of him. God, I ask you for the privilege of backing up in the shadows. And Holy Spirit of God, you do the preaching in that, we pray. Now, Lord. If there's somebody here's lost, I pray you'd save them. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Oh God, we got to face the world and the flesh and the devil tomorrow. Got to walk through this world. Give strength to do that, we pray. And we'll thank you and bless you and love you for all of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When you look at the book of Romans... Somebody said one time, said, what's the theme of the book of Romans? The theme of the book of Romans is the gospel. It starts with the gospel in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, ends with the gospel in Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Everything in between is about the gospel. Now, understand this. It is God's book of theology. Uh, when I was teaching and starting Bible Institute, somebody asked me, said, uh, uh, what uh, text do you use for your theology class? And I said, the book of Romans. They said, oh, you don't use so-and-so Easter. You know, I said, no, 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 no. The best book on theology in the world is the book of Romans. It is God's book of theology. Now, I outline it a little different than other folks. Romans chapter 1, verse 1 is the introduction to the book. When you come to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, you have the gospel. He presents the gospel to you. Then when you come to Romans chapter... Mm, 1 verse 18 through 3, 23, somewhere in there. Uh, I'm sorry, my mind is, I'm running, I'm, I'm, I'm two sentences ahead. All right, help me slow down, Lord, amen. Then, then you have the doctrine of sin. From that you have the doctrine of salvation. From that you have the doctrine of sanctification. From the doctrine, from that in 9, 10, and 11, you have the doctrine of scriptural Israel. Now, listen, there's a bunch of nuts running around telling you that 
That's God's three chapters on the sovereignty of God. They evidently have never read it. Hello? Yeah. Chapter 9 talks about Israel's past. Chapter 10 talks about Israel present. Chapter 11 talks about Israel future. All right, y'all looking at me. Listen, there's the hyper-Calvinist, Calvinist, whatever you want to call it, idea. There's the Arminian idea, and in the middle is the truth, which is what we believe is Baptist. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I ain't got time to preach that. Amen. <laughs> now, folks, listen to me. Inherit in what I've just given you is every heresy in Christianity. Let's take it backwards. There's a bunch of folks in Christian circles that say what you need to do is you just need to go to work for God. You need to join the church. You need to get baptized. You need to take the Lord's Supper. Just immerse yourself in service. And because you immerse yourself in service, then you'll understand salvation and you'll be saved. A lot of folks going to hell on that. Second, there's the folks who say, well... If you're going to get saved, God's going to grab you by the seat, the pants, snap of the neck, and just toss you in salvation. You don't have any choice in it. I want to tell you something. If I understand anything about the great white throne judgment, what Jesus is going to judge folks on is the fact they made the wrong choice. Hello. After that sanctification... The Pentecostals and all that bunch charismatic, they've so messed up salvation and sanctification, put them together and entwined them, they don't even understand salvation. You say, well, preacher, how can you have heresy in salvation? Oh, listen, there's a lot of folks who are preaching a deficient gospel who are telling you, well, you get saved by this or that or the other or this or that. What about sin? Surely Oh yeah, listen, I know some preachers who can preach on every sin in the world and invent a few, but never tell somebody how to get saved. Amen? Now folks, listen to me. He first gives us the gospel. You with me? Now if I understand anything right, I'm going to have to go to a lost person. They need to hear the gospel before I start dealing with their sin. I need to give them the remedy first. Amen. Well, I got through that. That's our introduction. I want you to look with me, and I hurried. I want you to look with me at Romans chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> now, I love verses that just divide themselves into three parts. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, first, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's his salvation. Y'all are going to be strange again. Oh, no, pastor, that's his service. No, that's, that's his salvation. See that little word, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. It's literally the word for slave. Now, I get this, and I know we don't understand that. But in Paul's day, fully over half of the men you met on the streets of Rome were owned by somebody else. Hello? Paul said, listen, I'm slave of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Slavery was a normal thing. Every servant was a slave. They weren't paid servants. They were bought servants. And Paul knew exactly what he was saying when he used this word. Now, I want you to understand something. When you got saved, all you did was change masters. Uh, okay, look with me. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2. All right, got your Bibles? Ephesians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. He said, and you hath he quickened, made alive. You got born again. New birth, new creation. Everything's different. You hath he made alive who were, what? Dead in trespasses and sins. You weren't alive before. You were spiritually dead. There was nothing about you spiritually that was alive, period. 
He said, where at a time past she walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now get this. He said, here's a two-pronged attack. Number one, he said in verse two, where in a time past you walk according to the course of this world. What's the course of this world? That's culture. Right. I had a fellow in Nicaragua. He told me, he said, you know what's wrong with you? And I said, no. I, I mean, listen, somebody says that to you, they're going to tell you what's wrong with you. You might as well say no. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you say. Amen. I said, no. He said, you think your culture is better than my culture. I said, oh, you're wrong there. You do understand the United States is going to stand before God for exporting our wicked culture to Central America. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. Hey, folks, listen to me. When you talk about culture, there's all different kind of cultures. There's dope culture. There's football culture. There's school culture. There's sports culture. I mean, you can go on and on and on and on and on. When you look at Central America, in Panama, there's a culture. In Costa Rica, there's a different culture. In Nicaragua, there's a different culture. In Honduras, there's a different culture. And on and on and on and on up, clear to the United States, <coughs> we have a culture. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. Culture is designed for one thing, and that's to keep lost people lost. If I got some teachers in here, I'm sorry. But I'll tell you, we've come to a time in the United States where the schools have taken over our culture. Our kids don't have time to sleep anymore. They don't have time for family anymore. They're involved in everything in the world. Used to be the church decided the culture of the town. Not anymore. Amen. <coughs> When I was a boy, the school principal called our pastor to find out if he could do some stuff. Why? Because he knew if he set a certain date and the church was doing something, the children would not be at the school. That's not true anymore. We live in a wicked culture. I was talking to somebody and, and I said, you know, uh, every once in a while we... We'd been up around in, in Michigan, and I said, I, I've never seen so much booze and stuff. And he said, well, that's just culture. Amen? Yeah. That's what we live in. Now listen, the devil kept you lost with culture. Can you imagine how many folks were at ball games today? Well, I'd love to have that whole bunch to preach to. Woo, amen, glory to God. Look at the second thing. He said, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, who now, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Hey, listen to me. Your master was the devil. Amen. That's what Jesus told Pharisees. You, your father, the devil. His works will you do. When we were lost, you know who ran our life? The devil did. <laughs> Hey, glory to God, there came a day I changed masters. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, now, let me give you something. Oh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Here's the doctrine of slavery. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin... Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion, shall not rule as a king over you. For you're not under the law, you're under grace. Amen. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law? A fellow said to me, he said, well, man, if I believe in salvation by grace, I'd just do what I want to. And I said, that's it. You got it. We just don't want to do that stuff anymore. Right. Folks, I'm telling you, when I got saved, the booze was gone. It's gone. Yeah. Now, it was a year and a half before the cigarettes went. <laughs> oh, don't act past to me. Yeah. More addictive than the booze. Yeah. 
Look at this. Verse 16, know ye not to whom ye yield yourselves servants? Here's that same word, slaves, to obey. His servants, his slaves, you are to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. You were the slaves of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Now verse 19. He said, I speak half manner of men. He said, let me just put it in some vernacular you can understand. Because of the infirmity of flesh. For as you've yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Now, you know what he's saying? He's saying, you remember when you was lost? You ran to sin. Oh, not me, Pastor. You lie about other stuff, too. Yeah. The Bible says that we lay awake at night dreaming up sin. He said, just as much as you did that, you ought to be a servant to righteousness right now. Hey, folks, listen. I understand we talk about commitment. We ought to be committed to live for God. We ought to be committed to be a witness for God. We ought to be committed to be a helper of God. Amen. Glory to God. We ought to be just as committed to the things of God as we were committed to the devil and the things of Satan. Yeah. Amen. Mm. Well, Verse 22, being now, uh, but now being made free from sin, you became servants to God and have your fruit into holiness, the end everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God. Yes. You say, well, preacher, how is it that I changed masters? You come to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6 and verse, I think it's about verse 19. He said, you're bought with a price. Yes. Peter tells us the price. It is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I've been bought. I've been redeemed. I've been bought back. Jesus Christ paid the price for my sin. He died for me. Now folks, listen. If he's bought me back, I've changed masters. And I ought to be living like I have changed Masters. Amen. Now that's the legalistic part of it. <laughs> you, you say, preacher, oh yeah, 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 that's just plain old legalism. I'm sorry. You did that, y'all do that. God's called you to do that. Get doing it. Legalistic. Can I tell you the spiritual part? When you go to the book of, I think it's uh, the book of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 7, he said, now you're more than a servant. You're more than a slave. You're a son. <laughs> when I changed masters, I didn't just become a slave of Jesus Christ. I became a son with all the blessings, with all of the inheritance, with everything. But folks, listen to me. I'll never be a son until I'm a slave. Woo. Well, let's look at the second thing. He said, Paul, a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. That's his salvation. Secondly, he said, called to be an apostle. That's his service. Now, folks, there's two kinds of service. There's general service and there's specific service. Let me just give you the five things of general service. We pray, we read our Bible, we show up at God's house, we tithe and give offerings. Is that five? That's four. Pray, read our Bible, tithe. Oh, show up at God's house and we're a witness for Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. God requires those five things out of every child of God. When you change masters, that became your life. That's the primary reason for your life. 
it's not that you have one foot still in the world and one foot in the church and you do half of that stuff you used to do and half stuff no 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 he's called you to do those five things to pray that means spending time with God every day it means talking to him let him talk to you through his word we read our bible we're a witness for Jesus Christ we ought to be a witness every place we go now I didn't get a whole lot okay I gotta explain that one amen <laughs> hey folks if somebody prayed for us if somebody told us about Jesus yeah. surely we got a responsibility to tell others about Jesus and pray for others amen hallelujah amen. we're being God's house amen. got one <laughs> two do you understand that what God's called you to is that every time the doors of the church are open, you're supposed to be here. I want to tell you something. When I got saved, I, oh, I, I mean, before I'd been paid to go to church, I was a music youth director. All of a sudden, I wanted to go to church. I mean, I, you know, I, I showed up for everything. My, matter of fact, I ended up cleaning church. I was a custodian. Woo, amen. I had a glory time. Amen. <laughs> Hear me. It's not that I had to go to church. I wanted to go to church. I even tried to go to the women's meeting. They wouldn't let me. Amen. Now get this. That's our responsibility. We're supposed to tithe and give offerings. Yeah, I'll make some of you mad maybe here. I don't know. Hey folks, the tithe is the Lord's. Not yours. You have no right to do with it that you want. The fellow said to me, he said, well, I understand tithes the Lord. I said, do you understand the rest of that? He said, the rest of what? I said, you do understand it all belongs to the Lord. See, when you talk legalistic, you talk about the tithe. When you're talking Christian, you're talking about everything. You see, I am not just to give a tithe. I'm to be a good steward of everything. It amazes me. I talk to new Christians, new converts, and, and I, uh, they say, well, preacher, we just can't do that. And I said, really? He said, no. You know what the problem is? They're up their eyeballs in debt. Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> hey, listen, folks. One time... And this was this was before I think this was before you and I got saved, if I remember right. But we we'd grown up in Christian homes, and and we had a choice: we could give our tithe or pay a bill. I said, "Well, I was taught tithe. We're gonna tithe." Now, folks, listen. We had no increase in funds. We got no more money, but God paid the bill and paid the tithe that same amount of money. You say, preacher, that's financially impossible. Not with God. Amen. I had a student, his name was Eliulio, and uh, he came to me and he said, I'm going to go pastor another church. And I said, why? That church don't believe nothing. He said, yes, but my family's hungry. I said, so you're going to go over there and pray? Yes, 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 yes. They can feed my family. I said, do you tithe? He made $100 a month. He said, I'm too poor to tithe. I said, brother, you too poor not to tithe. <laughs> what you're saying is, I'm disobeying God. So I'm going to go over here and disobey God more so God will bless me. Now, he did something that's very rude in that society. He just turned around and walked off. You always say, compliment me, so something, you know. Excuse me, pardon me. He just turned and walked off. So I knew he was mad. And I got to watch it. A year later, I said to him, I want to ask you a question. You didn't go pastor at church. You're still here. I said, looks like your family's eating better and you're wearing better clothes. And uh, Tell me what happened. He, he, he kind of smiled. He said, uh, I decided to obey God whether I understood it or not. That's good theology, folks. <laughs> now, the church that could not support him, could not feed his family, 
a year later was buying land 10 kilometers away and they were going to build a building on it and start a mission. We're not talking about money from the states. We're talking about money from that church. I said, the church is doing a lot better. He said, yes, I've been teaching them for a year. Just obey God whether you understand it or not. Amen. Now listen, God says those five things. Pray, read your Bible, witness, attend church, tithe, give offerings. That's the general. I mean, God expects that everybody. But wait a second. God has specific work. Now, I want to say something to you. If you're a member of this church, God's got a job for you. Right. Hello. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm getting some. I'm... I'm Listen, there's something he wants you to do in this church. He got a job. You say, well, preacher, I, I don't know what my job is. Well, let me help you a minute, all right? I love sound men. They make me sound good, amen. I love nursery workers. We, a pastor, a big old church, Calvary Baptist Church, and, and, and we had revival services on Tuesday night. I'm telling you, the whole place filled up. We seated 600. Had all these visitors. It was really something else. And, and uh, after service, uh, when my ladies came walking down the aisle, and she was walking like this, and I thought, this is not going to be good. <laughs> she came walking up to me, and I'm standing there, and she said, Preacher! You see that right there? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that's where I pulled my hair out. Me and 14 youngins. <laughs> I said, uh, and I, boy, I listen, I'm drawing blood, biting my lip, trying not to laugh because it was not funny to her at all. And, and I said, uh, uh, well, why do you get somebody to help you? And she said, I tried to stop two women, and they hurried on. <laughs> I said, well, send me a message. I said, I'll get somebody to help you. She said, preacher, you see that right there? I said, oh, yes, ma'am. She said, that ain't happening again. <laughs> she turned and walked out. Hey, I love work nursery workers. You, you do understand that the devil pinches babies during an invitation. You do understand that. I had a fellow in church, he's kind of a new convert, and I was preaching on the gifts of the Spirit. By the way, God never told you to find your gift. He told you to go work for God, and your gift will become very evident. Well, he came right here, and I'm standing up there. He said, Preacher, I don't have any gifts. And I said, So God lied. <coughs> Oh, no, 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 God, God doesn't lie. And I said, you just called him a liar. He said, no, no. I said, yeah, he did. You said you don't have any gifts. And God said he's giving you something. He said, well, I don't know what it is, preacher. I said, would you let your pastor help you? He said, I wish you would. So I took him about an arm, laid him out in the vestibule. Got a handful of bulletins, stuck it in his hand. I said, everybody comes through that door, gets a hug or a handshake, an encouraging word from God and a bulletin. He said, I can do that. He was the best greeter we ever had. Y'all know what the mully grubs are? Yeah. Yes, no? Yes. You gotta help me here. You come church. You get the door. He grabbed you, hug you neck and said, Oh, isn't God good to just save us? Keep us out of hell. Welcome to house of God. Have a bulletin. You walk on and say, Woo, going to be a good day today in God. Yes, amen. He had that ability. Now he got sick. So a couple of my men decided to do it. And I finally told him, I said, Get away from the door. <laughs> amen. Oh. What are you supposed to do in God's house? You said, preacher, God hadn't given me anything to do. 
I'm feeling he has. Now this is what I'm going to say to you. What's a normal Christian? It's a Christian who takes care of the general things. Praying, Bible study, witnessing, being to the house of God, tithing, giving offerings. Amen. The young man came out of the back, walked to the pastor, crying, and said, Preacher, God's called me to mission field. And the preacher said to him, No, he's not. Go back and sit down in the pew. His tears dried up. He went back. Afterwards, he said to the pastor, Pastor, why'd you talk to me like that? He said, Son, why should God send you over there to do what you're not doing here? Six weeks later, he came down the aisle. He wasn't crying this time. He was smiling. He said, Pastor, I believe God's called me mission field. Pastor said, I do too. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Why should God give you something specific to do in a church if you're not praying, reading your Bible, giving tithes and offerings, showing up to the house of God? being a witness for Jesus Christ. My intelligent girl's not here tonight, is she? Oh, when you see her, tell her she missed it. I got to have an, oh, there's a, oh, there's an intelligent girl right there. Amen. Is she intelligent? I, I know she's partly blonde. I just don't know. Let me ask you a question, Okay. What do you do when you don't know what to do? I used to tell my students, yes, but no. They said, that's an impossible answer, but yes, but no. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Stay with me. I see fear in her eyes. Why do I see fear in her eyes? They don't know either, okay, amen? You know what you do when you don't know what to do? You do what you know to do until you know what to do. Amen. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do what you know to do until you know what to do. Just go ahead and pray. Just keep your head in the book. Just spend time at God's house. Make it a priority. Just decide you're going to tithe and give all friends if it hair lips the devil. Witness for Jesus Christ. Every place you go, be a witness for Jesus. I'm telling you, God will give you something specific to do in the house of God. <laughs> but I've met a lot of folks in the house of God that think that somehow God's just supposed to manifest something in their pride and arrogance. Hmm. Let me give you the third thing. He said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, that's his salvation. Called to be an apostle, that's his, sanct that's his uh, service. Separated in the gospel of God, that's his sanctification. That little word, separated, is our same word as sanctification what's his sanctification he said I'm separated under the gospel of God now the first thing we've got to know is what's the gospel the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that's the good news most of the time I'll say you know what's the gospel well it's the death burial resurrection of Christ well yes and no well, it's the good news, yes or no. The good news is he has died for our sins. Amen, glory to God. Hallelujah. That's good news. That means I can go to heaven. That means I don't have to go to hell. Amen. I'm just looking at him. You know the great thing about that verse? It says, how that Christ died for your sins, your dirty, rotten, filthy, shadow. That's right, amen. No, don't. 
It says how that Christ died for our sins. I just wicked as you were, you just wicked as I was. Amen. And he died for all our sins sins. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Paid the price. Amen. Good news. He's already done the work. Paid the price. So we can be saved. Paul said, I am separated unto that gospel. Now let me explain that to you. My daddy one time before he died when he was 90 and he lived in our home those last years and and uh, one day I came in and he said son you know what's wrong with you preachers <laughs> I said uh, uh, no daddy I don't know he said uh, you keep saying don't do this stop doing this quit doing this don't do this stop doing this quit doing this don't do this I said I understand I understand what you're saying he said but you don't tell folks what to do That deflated my ego real quick. Holy Spirit of God said, yeah, he got you, don't he? <laughs> I said, well, Dad, explain what you mean. He said, all right, let me illustrate. He said, let's say I lead Bill to the Lord. And uh, he said, on Sunday, Bill comes to church and, and said, uh, we just have a great time. Now, you got to understand, church I grew up in, uh, back in the, Oh, in the late 50s was running 800 to 1,000 people. And those folks weren't people who came to other churches. Those folks were people that church wanted to Jesus. They had 24 deacons. To be a deacon in that church, you had to actively be seeking lost people for Jesus. You didn't have to win somebody every year, but you better be trying. And if you weren't trying, you didn't stay a deacon. Ooh. And he said, after I presented him to the pastor, and the pastor was in the church, and after we rejoiced, and I mean they rejoiced, it wasn't none of this. Well, now you all come by and hug his neck, and half the folks go out the back door. I threatened one time put a deacon at every door, and you couldn't get out unless you'd been up front first. <laughs> he said, I'm going to say to Bill, Bill, you know any lost folks? He said, now Bill knows lost folks. I don't know lost folks. He said, I'm separating lost folks. I don't, I don't. He said, he'll say, yeah, my brother-in-law Jim, he's lost. Can we go see him using that? Yeah. He said, I'll pick you up. He said, I'd pick Bill up. By the time we got to Jim's house, I instructed him how to turn off the television, how to diaper a baby if he didn't know how to diaper a baby, how to get in the floor and play with kids if they're causing disturbance, how to ask the wife for a glass of water if she kept interrupting He said, we get to the house. He said, I'm going to sit down with him. And Bill's already getting the television off. And I'm going to say to Jim, Jim, can I just show you some scriptures? Sure, 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 sure. And he said, I'm going to go through the scriptures. And when I'm finished, I'm going to say to Jim, Jim, you know your brother-in-law Bill got saved last week. Yeah, man, I can really tell a difference in his life. Bill, tell him what happened. He said, now, Jim may get saved, Jim may not get saved, but Bill is ruined. I said, what's ruined? And he said, son, don't you realize you can't be a witness for Jesus Christ and drink. You can't be a witness for Jesus Christ and smoke. You can't be a witness for Jesus Christ and watch porno. You can't be a witness for Jesus Christ and gossip. Take any sin you want. Amen. But what happens is being a witness for Jesus Christ will exclude that sin. Did you get that? Preacher, when I was a boy, they used to call them besetting sins. Oh. I thought, boy, that must be some horrible sins. Amen. The problem was they never told me. What, I was just a little boy. I didn't, nobody ever told me what a besetting sin was. So I'm thinking, whoo, that's got to be bad. I mean, that's, that's got to be murder or something. You know, that's horrible. 
because they always said it, besetting sins. <laughs> well, I was a teenager, and, uh, and the preacher was preaching, and he talked about besetting sins. That's sins you can't seem to overcome. I said, ooh, finally somebody told me what it was. <laughs> you say, preacher, I got a besetting sin. Can I tell you what to do? Go get your Bible, find you a lost person, knock on their door, go in on them and tell them about Jesus. Y'all got quiet on me. Hello? Preacher, I'm having trouble with this. Go tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. You say, that'll deal with my sin. That'll deal with your sin. Amen. Hello? Uh, uh, I have a friend and he said that every time he'd have a problem with lust, he'd uh, get his Bible and read it and said that worked for a while. And then he found out he just needed to go tell somebody about Jesus. Y'all got that? Do y'all understand that? Some of y'all don't understand that. Hey folks, you can't do one and do the other. You see, here's what I know. When somebody would come and sit down in my office when I was pastoring and said, I'm having a real problem with this, sin, with this sin, I'd say, you're not a witness for Jesus Christ, are you? I knew they weren't. Why? Because they were not a witness for Christ. You saying now, preacher, are you saying that witnessing will solve all my problems? Oh, you're finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. Did you know the witness and a heal your mind? Oh, I had a lady in the church and she was just a hoot. She really was. She had clinical depression. I'm talking about the bad, bad, bad stuff. And so the state of Mississippi and all of their wisdom decided they'd drill a hole in this side of her head, drill a hole in this side of her head, put electrodes in there, and kill out the bad brain cells that were causing her depression. Not one time, not twice, but three times. She's almost a walking zombie. But hallelujah, God left her enough brain cells to get saved. Amen, glory. <laughs> she called me one day. I'm in the study. She said, Brother Bob, I said, hey, how you doing, Sister Elsie? I'm depressed. I said, how depressed are you? She said, I took the pistol barrel out of my mouth to call you. That's depressed. I said, you want help? She said, that's why I called. I said, will you do what I tell you to do? She said, I don't know. I said, just go ahead and put the pistol back in your mouth, pull a trigger and go on to heaven. I, I'm, I'm sorry, that's the way you had to talk to her. Amen. She understood that. No, 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 no. I said, so you're going to do what I tell you to do. Yes, sir. I said, great. Number one, go put the pistol up. Folks, God gives us some common sense. Amen. I'm not going to sit there and talk to her with a pistol in her lap. Hello. She came back. I said, now, you got any tracks, church bulletins? She said, I got a handful of both. I said, great. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to go get in the tub or in the shower. You're going to put your makeup on. You're going to get dressed. You're going to every house in your neighborhood. And you're going to tell them about, invite them to Jesus and invite them to church. Oh, Brother Bob, I said, you said you do what I told you to do. Now hang up the phone and go do it. Two hours later, she called me back. She said, oh, Brother Bob, said, you just wouldn't believe it. Said, I almost won this lady to Jesus today. And, and said, I've got a family that's coming to church on Sunday. And I said, amen, good. She said, it's great. Amen. amen. Every time she got depressed, I'd send her out. <laughs> Hello. You say, well, but, but preacher, that's a physical problem. No, that's a spiritual problem. Man, when I'm down low and 
I feel like the whole world's against me. And it is, by the way. If I don't know if you know that. <sighs> then I get to Mully Grubs. I've learned to just get my Bible. Go tell somebody about Jesus. Can I give you a standard of life? When you get up in the morning, thank God for saving you. Thank God for keeping you. Ooh, I'm, we got an eternal salvation. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank God for using you. And ask God to put somebody in your path that day you can tell about Jesus. My daddy was homebound. He said, son, I don't ever get to witness to anybody. Would you take me witness? And I said, I'll do that. I will. You just pull up, honk on the horn, they come out to the car and let him. Amen. Folks, it works. Well, I came home one day and the, the, the uh, air conditioner repairman was there. Uh, and he's kind of backing up and, and uh, daddy was saying, listen, you need to get saved. You need Jesus. And here's what I found out. If you stand in the door, I'm big enough fella, if I stand in the door, the air conditioner repairman can't get out the door. <laughs> Hello? He loved it when Jehovah Witness came by. <laughs> he loved it when the Mormons came by. Amen? Hey folks, make it the theme of your life. Amen. Just tell folks about Jesus. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. He is my sanctification because he's called me out of darkness to light. That means that if I'm going to get separated from sin, I've got to turn this way. And he uses the gospel to do it. Well, I've got to quit. When I was pastoring in Ripley, Tennessee, and Ripley was one of those places we stayed for five years, and it was war from the day we walked into place. It, it was one of those, seriously, folks, I didn't pastor the church. I refereed it. I thought I should have wore a black and white striped shirt to the pulpit every Sunday morning, and God saved all kinds of folks. It was amazing. There's no boy, he was redheaded. He was a master diesel mechanic. Now, when I say a master diesel mechanic, I'm talking about the other diesel mechanics. When they ran a stump, ran a problem, they called him. He was that good. And I'd witnessed to him. And one Friday night, we had family night, and <coughs> I was going to stay home. And God just laid him on my heart. And I told Joy, I said, "Listen, I I, I need to go see Red. I need to talk to him." And her and the kids said, go on, go on, we'll pray for you. And so I went over it, all the way over I'm driving and I'm praying, Lord, have Red at home by himself. And let me tell you why. Red and his wife lived here. He had a son and daughter-in-law and, and three, four, five grandchildren lived here. On the other side he had a daughter and son-in-law and uh, they had three, four, five kids. And in the, behind him was the other uh, son and his wife and they had three, four, five kids and they, they never locked Red and his wife never locked the door. They just wandered through there all day long, all day long, all night. And I knew if that bunch was in the house, I'd never get a chance to witness to Red. So I prayed, oh God, have them all gone. Got there, knocked on the door. One of the grandsons came to the door, and I said, is Red here? And he said, Oh, hi, Brother Bob said, yeah, and it's strange. It's spooky around here. I said, what? He said, there ain't nobody here but him. <laughs> hey, folks, I've watched God bring people, sober folks, up to get saved. I've watched him bring, God bring folks down off highs to get saved. He can do that. I walked in, sat down, and I said, Red, I came to talk to you about Jesus. He began to cry. He said, Preacher, I'm so glad you came. I've been wanting to talk to you bad. And I sat there and had the privilege of taking my Bible and leading Red to the Lord. Amen. It was amazing. Just as soon as he got saved, the door opened. Here come all these folks in there. Amen. Glory to God. Well, God changed Red, and all of a sudden, the back two rows in our church were Red's back two rows. Why? Because him, his wife, 
his youngins and all his grand youngins were at church every time doors were open. Amen. One Sunday morning, I stand at the front, did an invitation, and here come Red down the aisle. He's just a weeping and a crying. I said, Red, why'd you come? He said, Preach, you, you remember a couple months ago, you came over to the house and you took the Bible and showed me how to get saved. And I said, yeah, Red, I do. I remember it so well. He said, Preacher, I'm telling you, God overhauled my engine. He put in all new parts. That's, that's good theology, amen. <laughs> he said, but Preacher, I think this morning I just need a tune-up. I said, Red, get over here to the altar and get you tune-up. Every once in a while, he'd come down the aisle. He said, Preacher, don't need to talk to you. Me and God need to do a tune-up. Let me ask you a question. You need a tune-up tonight? All oh, things used to be so wonderful. You shouting the victory and the glory of God rested upon you. God opened doors and you had opportunities to lead folks to Jesus. You'd read the word of God and it was so real to you. You'd pray and it's like the presence and glory of God just descended upon your soul. But somehow things have crept in and somehow your priorities have changed and somehow things are different. You need to come get a tune up tonight. Some of you already ought to be getting up out of the pew and come on get an altar. The pianist is coming. Well, if you need to get an altar, that's fine. That won't bother us a bit. Amen. Amen.